Tina Koto Katoa. Uh, ko pupita, ko pukita papa te maunga. Uh, ko te awa, unga te awa, no tamaki makoto aho. Yee. Ko Michael toku fai ipu. Ko Bella taku tamahine, ko Jesse taku tama, ko Julia toku ingoa, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. It is great to be in my backyard today. You could pretty much throw a machete and hit my house from here. <laughs> Please don't. Um, <laughs> although if it happened, I wouldn't be surprised because we're from West Auckland. All good. <laughs> oh, such a pleasure. Thank you so much to uh, Pastor Jody and also Pastor Sam and the whole team for inviting us back. We had an amazing time with the ladies and I think, I'm thinking that was like two years ago. Time passes awfully quickly when you're nearly 50. Um, it just goes real quick. So was there anyone that was in that session with us? In the late, hey, they've come back. Thank you so much. Others, nice to meet you. I see some, some familiar faces from my childhood down the back there. Lovely, lovely. Hi. <laughs> I do recognise you. Beautiful. H haven't we had an amazing morning? Oh my gosh. And uh, I was speaking to Tasta Parker um, afterwards and he was like, did you enjoy it? I said, I got my new theme. Thank you. You've saved me a lot of time. It was real cool because I actually feel like God dropped something into my spirit this morning to really seal the deal with what we're talking about this afternoon. With my story and with the journey of what I do, I, you know, I do often, some of it, I, I repeat myself. I do end up telling the same story, but I also believe that there's something really powerful about listening into the Holy Spirit and knowing, you know, when do we change? How do we frame that each and every time? So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. But we can still listen into the Holy Spirit and, and what He's saying. And I, I thought of this amazing little piece of writing in Isaiah, and I just wanted to share it. You'll be so familiar with it. In fact, I think Jesus got up in, in the synagogue and said this. Um, so I'm following in pretty big shoes, big sandals, probably. Um, but he said, the Spirit of God, the Master, is on me because God has anointed me. Now, this is not about me today. This is for you. Okay, so yeah, I'm doing this. The only thing that differentiates me from you is a little bit of geography, and I might be wearing brighter clothing. But we are all part of the body. I do not have any, like, uh, status or all that stuff. I'm, I hate that stuff. I'm about we are one. You know, we're all the same. And so I'm sharing my story today, but any one of you could just as easily stand up and give a testimony today. Amen? Yeah. So the Spirit of God, the Master, is upon me because God's anointed me. He sent me to preach good news to the poor. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. Um, we're in Auckland House Prices. Uh, heal the broken heart, broken. Announce freedom to the captives. Pardon the prisoners. God sent me to announce a year of his grace, a celebration of God's destruction of our enemies, and to comfort those who mourn. Who's had a period of time in their life where they have mourned, where our hearts have been broken, where we have been grieved, where we have woken up in the night and cried our little hearts out? You know, those times where we've found ourselves at the end of ourselves, where we no longer can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Today I'm here to comfort those of you who sounds like someone's being murdered next door. We're just going to ignore them. They're young and we will forgive them. All right. <laughs> to care for the needs of those who mourn, give them bouquets of roses instead of ashes. I love that. Messages of joy instead of news of doom, a praising heart instead of a languid spirit. And there was a little bit of here, and it says, because you got a double dose of trouble, you got a double dose of trouble, and more than your share of contempt, your inheritance in the land will be double, and your joy will go on forever. I bet there's people in the room today who feel like they've got a double dose of trouble at the moment or some stage in their world or in their life. And today what I want to do is I want to share my story. But I want to remind you and encourage you that today is about redeeming your story. So I'm going to share my story, my journey through dealing with mental wellness issues, um, through dealing with depression and anxiety, um, and dealing with the stuff that I deal with, and hopefully encourage you in your well-being as you learn to encourage and restore your soul. But I also want you to, to, to be listening out for the moments in your own heart where God can take your, your big story, your double trouble story, and turn it into something that he can be celebrated for and lifted up in. All right, so, you know, life can be really, really unexpected. 
stuff happens to us all. So the other day, I took my daughter's car out onto Lincoln Road and I ran it into the back of a parked truck. Now, I don't have any reason for that. Uh, no excuse, really. I just, you know, ran as the back of a car, so we'll leave that part of the story there. But, you know, it's sort of, it's not the normal order of the universe. Normally, your, your teenager's supposed to write your car. Has anyone's teenager written off their car? See, that would be normal. No, I like to do things a little differently. I wrote off my daughter's car. Anyway, so I took it down to the panel beater um, out there in Westgate, and I said to him, you know, can I get a higher car? And he's like, oh, I don't know, but he, I, I twisted his arm. And he said, look, I can give you a higher car, but there's something about this car that you need to understand. First of all, instead of a handbrake, this car has a foot brake. Now that is important information right there. So I tucked that away in my brain for future use. I was like, yes, listening. Now then he started to, I can only describe this as mansplain. <laughs> Ladies, you know what I mean, eh? Like they start telling you stuff that you're right, really. He's like, blah, blah, petrol, blah, blah, whatever. You know, I'm like, eh, switched off. I'm more of a big picture kind of a girl. So I, I, I tucked that away and, and, and off I went. Now I pulled up to the intersection, looking across to pack and save on the hill and Massey there, and it's on a little, little bit of a lean, and that's important, and I stopped. Now at this point, my conscious brain and my subconscious brain had a kōrero, a little conversation. Now, Michael and I travel around the country and around the world when they'll let us, speaking about mental health, talking about the brain. I'm fascinated with the way our conscious and our subconscious brain interact. How often the stuff that we think and feel is just the tip of the iceberg. It's just like the very, very top. And so much of what is going on inside of us is a result of things that we don't even know are happening. All of our previous experiences, other times when we've driven a car, you know, things that people have said, other emotional responses, all those things are going on underneath the surface. Long before it becomes a conscious thought, it's already happening in your brain. Your brain's a lot quicker than you think. So my conscious brain said, oh, oh, foot brake, foot brake. The man said foot brake. So I put on the foot brake and I was feeling very smug and self-satisfied. I was like, yes, I am nailing life. Unfortunately, at the same time, my subconscious brain had something to say. Now, my subconscious brain said, normally at this point, your left hand would have something to do. Now, someone in all their wisdom had designed this car so that where the handbrake would normally be was the handle that makes the seat lie down. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Not designed by a woman, clearly, but anyway. So I stop, I smile smugly at the girl next to me, I reach down, uh, grrr, I disappear. She's panicking, because I'm gone, you know. She, I'm going to assume that she thought I'd been raptured, because I'm so spiritual. <laughs> I don't know what your handbrake moment is. I don't know when in your life you have reached for something and it's not what you expected a heartbreak, a financial disaster, a business gone under, somebody disappointed you, someone just not done what they said they were going to do, a situation that's been your double trouble. I don't know what it is. But I want to encourage you today that God can take any story and redeem it. Because yeah. I'm here today to give a story that I did not expect. Can I let you in on a secret? I didn't think I was going to be here. I didn't think I would be up here talking about depression and anxiety because I didn't think I had it. I'd never experienced this stuff. I'd never had a panic attack. Life had been pretty sweet. I'm still looking for the verse in the Bible that says, yea, though, verily, it's all going to be sweet as. <laughs> if you find it, let me know. It's probably in numbers somewhere. <laughs> Let's face it, no one's ever read it. No, I'm kidding. But, you know, there, there's nothing in there that says that. All, all the Bible says is, I'll never leave you, and I'm never going to forsake you. So I don't know what you're going through, but God can use anything. Yeah. If he can use my story, he can use yours. And I began to realise that I was dealing with a, a stress level that was going up and up and up and up and up. As I began to deal with some things in my world during what I like to call my neck minute year. Now, this is when I turned 40. This is nine years ago. Now I have what I call my neck minute year. You're familiar with neck minute? 
Life was going pretty sweet. Next minute. <laughs> All just turned to custard. Now, I've been married 17 years to my childhood sweetheart. I had a beautiful home. I'd been traveling and singing and wonderful ministry and all these fantastic, exciting things that God was really blessing me with. And in one conversation, my husband of 17 years decided he no longer wanted to be married to me. Now, in my world and my faith and my whanau and my expectation, this is not what I had signed up for. This was a handbrake moment. You know, life goes on and we have... Um, reconciled our differences during those time and I appreciate that with him but the season that it threw me into just was overwhelming and I began to realize that if you could see a little stressometer in my world it was just going up and up and up and stress began to turn into panic attacks and panic attacks turned into spirals of anxiety and eventually into clinical depression and I realized that what I was dealing with was more than just a tough day it was more than just a broken heart. It was actually something that my brain was not firing in the way that it used to do. Mental health issues can come in different ways. They can just be a little burnout when we feel like we're just starting to flicker and we've just had enough and we need to make a change. Wouldn't it be great if we were able to grab it there? But sometimes it gets bigger. Sometimes it's hereditary stuff. Sometimes it's just an, an illness that's passed down in our family. My dad's got blue eyes. I got blue eyes. My mum sometimes dealt with depression, and sometimes we do inherit some of these things. Doesn't mean my dad was a Freemason or some woo-woo stuff. Just means that sometimes we actually inherit some of those things, and that's actually just part of life. But we deal with these things differently. I like to say my life is like a long series of getting knocked off my high horse and getting back on progressively smaller horses. And right now, I'm saddling up a chihuahua. <laughs> Honestly, it's deeply humbling. But once again, the story has brought me to where I am today to encourage those who are dealing with their stuff. So I thought I'd start by singing a song. I know I did one in my pre-show, for those of you who are here. She was pretty good, my, uh, my warm-up act. Not too bad. Yeah, stole one of my songs, but whatever. Um, <laughs> but during, during the period of time between... Um, actually, no, I will, I will digress there. Someone asked for Beautiful Survivor. Should we do that? Yeah, we'll do that one, all right. I sang this song first when I was in Nelson. And, um, and this guy was sitting kind of around about like where you are here, and it was, was one of those small little events where um, he, the lights were very bright on him and on me, and, and he sat there, he had a big beard, and during my whole song he just gave me the death stare. <laughs> you know how guys just give it that... And I'm playing my guitar and smiling and trying to look spiritual, but inside I'm like freaking out. <laughs> I'm thinking he hates me. I don't know what I've done, but this guy hates me, you know. Anyway, at the end of the, of the show, I went to the back to the merch table and he, he made a beeline for me. And I thought, I don't know what it is he doesn't like, but I think I'm about to find out. <laughs> but as he came a little closer, I noticed he had a tear coming down the side of his face. And he said to me, Julia, that was the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I was like, bro, just a little bit of feedback during the song would have been awesome. <laughs> But thanks. <laughs> but now this is a song that talks about um, the, the voice of God speaking into your circumstances. He says, I'm always on your side, even when you struggle. Sometimes especially when we struggle. Sometimes it's in our roughest times that we sense that, that thing that, you know, that God will be with us even in those times. And so I want to encourage you today, no matter what's going on, you can be the beautiful survivor. Sometimes the night is so deep You just cannot sleep For all that's surrounding you Everything said circles your head You feel like you're drowning But here in the shadow You know I won't leave you alone I said I would never abandon you Well, I'm always on your side, even when you struggle. It makes your wings grow 
couple of statistics in, in relation to our minds, our souls, our well-being, and it's a little bit a little bit confronting, but according to the Mental Health Foundation, one in two New Zealanders will meet the, the criteria for a mental health diagnosis in their lifetime. So their brain is being put under so much pressure that they could get a diagnosis of something in their lifetime. Not necessarily going to happen, but it might. And yet half of churches are saying we, we really or never mention this stuff. You know, we talk about restoring the soul. I'm like, gosh, this is really to do with our well-being. It's bigger than just one facet. And so that's why I feel really passionate about doing this. Often stuff happens in our world and we don't give ourselves the time, the space or the skills to restore and get better. We don't give ourselves the time, the space or the skills to get better. We just keep on going. We keep on going, and we keep on going until eventually we begin to burn out. Uh, nearly a quarter of pastors have said they personally deal with mental wellness issues, and I'm surprised that the number's not higher. Um, possibly some feel they can't say, you know, because they feel like they're going to be judged. And so the first time I ever heard anyone talk about mental health in church was me, and I was dealing with it myself at the time. And I thought, man, I'm just going to keep having this conversation until I feel like it's okay to talk about this. God created our brains with some off switches. Thank goodness for that. Because if we just keep going, we're going to burn ourselves out. I love what Pastor Tuck said this morning. The best gift you can give someone is a well you. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? I was like, write that down. Put that on a t-shirt. The best gift you can give someone is a well you in every area of your life. So what do we use? We use a wonderful model called Te Whare Tapafa. Who's familiar with this model? Love it. If you're in health or education, you will have come across this. This is a government mandated model from a wonderful researcher called Mason Jury. And uh, he, he posited that, you know, each one of us has these walls or different parts to our personality. And there's more than one wall to each of us. So we've got tahi henangaro, we've got a mental and emotional wall. Needs support, needs help, needs to be built up nicely. Along on the front, we've got taha whanau, our relationships and family. Who knows that if you're living in an abusive situation, if you've got someone in your world who's bullying you, putting you down, hijacking your work, blaming you for stuff that's not yours, that is going to erode your well-being. It's like a wall of your house has got big, big holes in it. The air is coming through and you are not going to be well if you're not living in situations where people are supporting and loving you. It's well worth looking. We've got taha tinana, we've got our, our physical wall there, and then we've got taha wairua, our spiritual wall. Now, 
I understand that nothing I say today is, is in any way intended to cut across what we understand as Christians. I'm not coming from an outside perspective. I'm with you. I love you. Okay. But I also sometimes feel to challenge some of our thinking around the stuff. So is that okay? I'll be really honest. Sometimes we pray for stuff that we could deal with ourselves. Too soon? <laughs> Went a bit cold in the room. <laughs> oh, Lord. Make me fit. <laughs> oh, God, if only you could invent a way that I could get fit. A place like a city with fitness for six ninety nine a week. Is that you, Lord? Oh, I speak the spirit of fitness all over me. I cast out the fat. <laughs> or I could just go for a walk. I could join the city fitness. I think that was a word from the Lord for me. Sometimes we need to use what God has already given us, which is our good sense, our two legs, our brains, our arms. Sometimes we, we're not using the tools that we've got already. Sometimes we're praying for good health while sitting in the KFC line. And God's like, I'm really trying, bro. I'm really trying. We jack ourselves up on caffeine and sugar and then we come running down the front going, I've got the spirit of anxiety. I'm like, no, you just had too much sugar. Your brain is simply responding in the way that it is. Okay, so just being honest. Now physical, what's our physical war? Now I was brought up in, in, in this understanding and I, I get what it is, but people say, oh, I'm not a spiritual, I'm a spiritual being. I'm not from around here, I'm heaven sent. <laughs> I'm not from these pits. Oh, Lord, I know I have no... You know, I'm just passing through. I'm like, stub your toe and come back to me. <laughs> Living with pain changes the way you see the world. If God wanted us to be disembodied spirits floating around in the atmosphere, we would be. But we're not. Why did he put us in these fallible But I don't know, but we're here. All right, so let's work with what we've got. Amen. All right. So we have three little things that we use to help us to understand some of this stuff, our overall well-being here. First of all, mental wellness issues are reasonable. They make sense. It makes sense to me that if you get under too much pressure, your brain will start going, ah, that'll do. Your grief gets too big. I'm just going to close off a bit here. Thank God we've got some off switches because some of us would just keep working ourselves to the bone. I'm passionate about caring for carers because some people care themselves to death on the altar of others. And unfortunately, ultimately, all we have to be responsible for is ourselves. Even if you're caring for someone else, you count. You know how Jesus loves everyone? That includes you. Even if someone else is trying to overtake you, I encourage you to get some good boundaries around that. They make sense. Secondly, mental wellness issues are universal. We are all on a well-being spectrum. Okay, all of us are on a wellness spectrum. Every breath we take is a mental wellness issue. <laughs> if you're smiling, it's a mental wellness issue. It's quite a nice one. <laughs> okay, but all of these emotions are on that scale. This is not about the good and the bad, the dumb and the smart, the can-dos and the can't-dos. This is about all of us on a spectrum. And it changes. You get older, it changes. You get a new job, it changes. You hit menopause. <laughs> changes. Hormonal change. Things change. Guys hit their midlife and suddenly discover that they can't handle doing all the things they, all the wonderful things they were doing. And they're like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. I feel burnt out. I feel expectations of others. I've put my ladder against the wall. I've climbed to the top and discovered I don't want to be on this building anymore. I'm stressed to the max. And sometimes all they can see is an out, is to end it all. And sometimes that's a really logical thought. It's not a great one, but I can see why it happens. Because we come to the end and we don't know what to do. We don't have the tools in the toolbox. You know, we're all on that spectrum. And there's, there's always someone who's like, oh, I don't need to hear this stuff. Wish I hadn't come. My wife made me. You know, they go, oh, because I'm really well. <laughs> well, you can always get weller. Because yeah. you can tell a weller woman. <laughs> By the way, she wears her hair. Thank you very much. And of course, in the wonderful and prophetic words of Rachel Hunter, it won't happen overnight. <laughs> Thank you. Some young ones are like, what just happened? 
ask your mother. <laughs> We're all on a spectrum. And finally, such great news is manageable. There are so many tools in the toolbox. You won't hear me talking about fighting depression, battling depression, winning against depression, or casting out depression. I talk about dealing with it and managing it. I'll be really honest with you, I deal with depression. Some days I wake up and it's really big in my world. And I have to get out every tool in the toolbox to make sure that I live a wonderful, productive day. Sometimes I wake up and it's really small in my world and you'd hardly even notice. But it doesn't mean that my life is over. A diagnosis does not mean it's all over over for you. All it means is you're going to have to get some tools in your toolbox. I also have a knee injury. When I was young, I thought it would be a good idea to road run. Wow. What a muppet. <laughs> I, you know, you, know you, you don't look after yourself when you're young. You know, now I'm like, my knee hurts, I've got this knee injury, and I need to be real careful with that knee. I strap it when I go skiing, and I look after it. Some days I wake up, and the issue with my knee is really big, and it hurts. Sometimes I don't even know why. I just wake up, my knee's sore, and I'm blooming knee. You know, here we go again, and I need to strap it and Voltar in it and do all the things that you do, you know. Some days I wake up, and it's like it's not even there. The pain, not the knee, because that, <laughs> <laughs> that would be a problem. But, you know, it's like it's, there's no pain there. And so some days we wake up and it's, it's, the stuff is bigger and we've got to get out all the tools. And I want to tell you that if you're dealing, wherever you are on that spectrum, you can live well. You can. And if it changes, if you do hit a stage in your life and it's a handbrake moment, you can still live well. It's actually Okay. There's a wonderful psalm that I just have, have walked through with this, this, this thing, and it's Psalm 94, 18. Unless the Lord had given me help, I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death. When I said my foot is dwelling, your love, O Lord, supported me. The silence of death. Oh, my gosh. I was brought up very hardcore, very British. My mum, post-war Barbara, very sensible woman. My father would just say, just show them your British passport. It was just about... Stiff up a lip, we can face this. I said to my mum once, oh, why can't we have a sparple? I want a sparple. Everybody else has got a sparple. That means one person I know has a sparple, by the way, if you've got children, yeah? Okay. She goes, I'll give you a sparple. <laughs> she put me in the bath, in my togs, with an egg beater. <laughs> It's not really the same, is it? No. Some of you young ones looking a bit panicked. It wasn't an electric egg beater. <laughs> she wasn't trying to kill me. No, no. Because in those days we had things called hands and they did stuff called work. You know, yeah, yeah. But that was her solution. But, you know, we, we were taught to keep calm and carry on. Have you heard of keep calm and carry on? Yeah, great for the Blitz of London. When the bombs are dropping... The Germans are flying overhead. You know, apologies if there's any Germans in the room. <laughs> I have forgiven you. <laughs> My father, not so much, but anyway. <laughs> it's all right. He's in a rest home. He thinks he's on a cruise ship now. <laughs> so I'm having the last laugh. But anyway, um, it, it was great for that time. It is not good for your, t your mental health in 2021. Keep calm and carry on is not serving us well. So I've got a new slogan. Today I want to throw some language into your world that you can use around your mental health. All right, are you ready? Make a big scene <laughs> and carry on. <laughs> it's so important that we are allowed in the time and the place to let it out, to actually release that stuff. We hold it all in. My mum had five children and she never complained. I'm breaking the cycle. <laughs> I complained constantly. <laughs> no, but she held it all in. She would never express that because it was because nice Christian ladies don't, you know, you just, it's all about just dying to self. And, and while I appreciate a little bit of that, it didn't do her any favours in the long run. And actually, it didn't do us as kids any favours to think that the magical fairies were somehow doing the washing. <laughs> we didn't grow up. You know, we, we need to grow up when we face that reality, yeah? So I like to say, don't be a volcano. Be a geyser. What's the difference? You know, a volcano just squashes it down. Squash it down. Absorb, absorb, take the pressure. Yes, yes, 
Yeah, I can be on that roster. Yep, no, that's fine. Yes, I can bring a cake. Oh, two cakes. Yes, yes. No, that's fine. I can dress you up as a pumpkin for school. No problem. Oh, it's in an hour? Absolutely. We can make that happen. Oh, you want uh, M&Ms for dinner? Yep, no, we can do that. We just take it on. We take it on. We take it on. And then one day, a volcano will just blow. Now, it's no joke when you're around it, but we know that a volcano, when it explodes, it is destru destructive, it's unpredictable, and it destroys everything in its path. It will blow up your world if you hold it all in. This is where people get to the point where they just explode, they implode their families. They sometimes will implode and explode their whole life because they've had enough and they didn't let it out. Don't be a volcano, be a geyser. What does a geyser do? Goes off once a day. <laughs> People stand around. Oh, look at her go. <laughs> Give her a pucky pucky. <laughs> they build a fence at a safe distance. <laughs> they hold hands. They pay money to see that stuff. <laughs> but you know why a guy, if you stand in the geyser, it'll burn you. Geysers are fun because they're safe. Because they're done in a controlled environment. This is about agreeing that I'm going to make a big scene on the understanding that you need to know I will carry on. This is not make a big scene and I'm going to walk out. This is not make a big scene and I'm going to go and tell all my friends how awful you are and put a horrible photo of you on my Facebook. And yeah, yeah. This is not about make a big scene and then I quit my job. This is make a big scene on the understanding that at the end of the scene, I'm still with you. I want to give you an example and I have her permission to do this, sort of. <laughs> my daughter came to me a little while ago and she, um, she'd been saving up well that's probably the whole story she hadn't she was supposed to have been saving up to get a ski pass and it was done under the, getting the, the cut off point the way they do it is they, they charge you a certain amount and then on a certain date it you know, goes higher she came to me the day before and I'd seen her not saving up over the summer now I knew she wasn't saving up because there were a lot of courier parcels <laughs> AliExpress, <laughs> oh, you know, Mecca Maxima, all turning up at our Sephora. The, the, the question is, how many makeup brushes does a young woman need? <laughs> and the answer is, a lot. More than you'd imagine, yeah? Some people are like, yeah, that's right. But I watched her spending her money. She was supposed to be saving up for the ski pass, and I knew she didn't have the money. But I did what all good passive-aggressive mothers did, and I just sat back <laughs> and watched it happen. <laughs> And the day came, and she came up to me. She's like, Mum, I'm so sorry. Now, she's a good kid. She's a really good girl. She's like, Mum, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the cut-off day's tomorrow, and I don't have enough money. Now, everything inside me wants to just go, oh, all right, you know, just passive-aggressive me. Oh, that's fine. Whatever, just chuck it on my credit card. <clears throat> you know, absorb the annoyance and take it away. And I thought, no, I need to practice what I preach. So I said, right, before I start... I need you to know I'm going to pay for this. I'm going to cover it, and you will pay me back. So I didn't want her doing this whole thing thinking, oh, what was going to happen? Am I not going to get my... Because that sucks. But I said, I need you to know that I'm going to make a big scene, but don't worry, we're going to carry on. She's like, okay, cool. I was like, right, here we go. I'm really annoyed that you have not been saving. And she's like, yeah, I know. And I was like, mm. <laughs> There's more. <laughs> I have watched these parcels come to the door and you have not been. She's like, oh, mum, I know, I know, I'm really sorry. I said, like, mmm, <laughs> a little bit more. It frustrates me and I went on, you know, and, and I let it out and at the end, of course, I covered it and yes, she did pay me back. But the understanding with the language is that we know that we're allowed to let it out but it's really important that the people around us know that it's a safe place. If you're letting it out includes punching the wall or threatening or violence of any sort, that is not okay, and that is not what I'm talking about. If it's a manipulative thing that is kind of like, well, so maybe at the end of this, I, I might not be around anymore. Mm -mm, that's not what I'm talking about. It's like, hey, I want to be with you, I love you, but I want to just express this to you in a safe place. It's okay to make a big scene. Don't forget to carry on. Second bit of language that I want to throw into the mix today comes from the scripture, talks about my foot is slipping, and it, it says to identify your weakness at the wobbly point. 
Now, what's the wobbly point? Don't turn to your neighbour and say, I see your wobbly points, because they will not appreciate that. <laughs> but what are our wobbly points? Wobbly points are the signals that our bodies give us that things are not going well. When things have gone wrong, I can bet your bottom dollar that if you rewind time, people will go, oh, yeah, I kind of knew. I kind of knew that something was wrong. Something was up. Now, it's easy to identify sometimes those emotional wobbly points in other people. Sometimes easier than, than identifying it in yourself. All right? So I want you to have a think about somebody that you know really well and love. And I want you to have a think, how do you know that they are under pressure? Not that they're telling you. Maybe not that they're even aware of it. But what are the subtle signals that they let off to say that things are not that great? Okay? So have a little think about that person. If you can't think of a person in that situation, ironically, very easy to read in your pet. How does your cat let you know that it's reached its wobbly point? Anyone want to share? How does your pet tell you that it's not doing well? They sits all hurled, crunched up, they, they go, go small and freaking out, yeah. What else do they do, yeah? They give you that look, hey, ca cats are evil, but I love them. <laughs> but they do, they, they, oh, the tail. <laughs> no, 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 I'm fine, that's absolutely fine, I'd love to do that. <laughs> do not trust this animal. What else... <laughs> How else do our pets let us? The tail, and all in the flip of the tail. Look at the ears. Yep. They do. They do. They sometimes they go on the attack. They'll they'll they'll, they'll lash out. Isn't it interesting how we can tell when an animal's at a wobbly point, but we can't tell it ourselves. We keep on going. Wouldn't it be cool if we identified our weakness at the wobbly point before it all falls apart? The, the, the verse says, my foot is slipping. Not my foot has slipped and I landed in a big dark hole. Wouldn't it be cool if we identified before that? And the language of the wobbly point is a really fun one to throw into your world. Great with kids? The great thing I love about the wobbly point is when someone says to me, I'm feeling a bit wobbly. I don't need to know when, why, how, what your mother said to you when you were seven. We don't need a 40-minute counselling session. I don't need a PhD. All I need to know is you're not quite right and I will treat you very differently. If a friend said to me, I'm just a bit wobbly, I would treat them very differently. Now, when I'm dealing with depression, when it's, it's getting big in my world, when anxiety is getting big in my world, I shut right down. Now, one of the biggest messages we've got with wellbeing and mental health has always been, if you need help, ask for it. Yeah, who's heard that? I've got bad news for you. That's the last thing I'm gonna do. I won't ask for help, I will ghost you. I will stop responding to messages. I will hide away in myself. People will respond in one of three ways. And these are natural, normal brain responses. Fight, flight, or freeze. These are not things to get upset and worried about. These are God-given fear, stress responses to save your life. Because if like a tiger came through the door, you'd need one of those three, right? You'd either run away, fight the tiger, or just freeze, probably not that helpful. <laughs> Especially in a tiger situation, eh? you're kind of like, damn it, how did I get that one? But in every group of people, there's, there's some that will do one or the other. Who knows that if I put you in the corner, you would come out fighting. Honestly, you are a fighter. You're kind of like, because we need some of those people, because if there's a fire, I will call you. <laughs> I'm wearing high vis. But ironically, I wasn't listening when they gave the instructions. So if there is an emergency, do not, under any circumstances, follow my instructions. <laughs> Most people will run. They'll run away. Who's a flighter? Who knows that they're, they're just, just, I'm outies. I'm out of here. Now, when I get under pressure and I feel no, no, my mental health's not that great, I don't run with my feet. <laughs> it would be great. Wouldn't that be handy? No. I run inside. I just disappear inside myself. And I start saying things like, I'm fine when I'm not fine. 
and I start to do those things. So these are where I can communicate and I can say that I'm feeling wobbly and I don't need to give all the information. Wouldn't it be amazing if, some, if anyone in this room now said to someone else in this room, I'm, I'm at my wobbly point, we would all know what you meant. We would get it. Wouldn't it be cool if we could just text an emoji of a jelly? <laughs> just go, I, I just, I don't know. I don't know what I want you to do. Well, can I help? I don't know. You know, do you need some counselling? I don't even know. I'm just all wobbly. I don't know. I just need to let you know that I'm at my wobbly point. We can predict sometimes when our wobbly points are going to come. If you've got a big week, chances are the end of the week might feel like a wobbly point. If you've got big highs, you might come out of that with quite big lows. End of conferences, wobbly point. Now, I was always taught that, you know, it just meant the devil was after me, but I'm kind of like, well, actually, it's probably more that my brain has been really, really stimulated, and it's on a bit of a whoop, whoop, having fun, and then I get home, and it's just like, <laughs> so instead of fighting that and going, no, get thee behind me, I'm going to keep working out, and I'm going to go, but actually, I've got to stop and think, what is my body trying to tell me? It's trying to tell me to rest because it's come to that point. Wouldn't that be cool if we started to listen? God gave us those signals for a reason. All right. Now, when we talk to one another, sometimes we've got to ask some questions that are a little bit deeper. I'll give you a little, I'll, I'll, I'll nerd out a bit on some brain chemistry here for you. When people are under pressure and they're feeling at their wobbly point, they're very much operating in a part of their brain that's just very emotional. They're in fight or flight mode. And a good way to bring them out of that, if they're looking at you with fear in their eyes and they've got tears and they're freaking out, a great way to talk to them is ask them a really practical problem-solving question. What it will do is just bring them right out of that part of their brain into a much more relaxed and calm state. If you're talking to someone and they're all just really logical and you're trying to get a bit deeper, Ask them an emotional question, and it will dig them right back into a completely different part of your brain. They don't operate at the same time. So ask a question that's really practical, or give them a practical task, and it will bring them out of that real stressed out state. Now the problem is, then we talk to people, and we're like, hi, you know, how you doing? I'm good. Here's a real good Kiwi chat. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. <laughs> that's it. Who's had that conversation already today? I know, we do it all the time, right? Oh my gosh, we just, on the surface, you know, what do you, oh, what do, you do? Oh, I do this. So we just talk about what do I do, where do you live, you know, it's just the surface stuff and we don't even get below the surface. Ask a question that takes them down. What do you do for a job? Oh, I'm a teacher. What's the best thing about being a teacher? Oh, that's going to pop me back into that emotional part. It's going to ask a question that's going to dig a little deeper. What's something that's happened this week? that really made you laugh. Oh, I can tell you that story. Something that will dig a little deeper. Some good questions, yeah? Now, I've been a school teacher for many years, mostly in West Auckland. The kids called Metallica and stuff. <laughs> I wish I was joking. Um, but I've been asked some amazing questions. I was wearing a ring one day with a big piece of glass and one of the kids goes, oh, miss, is that a diamond ring? Is that a real diamond? I said, if that was a real diamond, do you think I'd be here? <laughs> I've been asked, what colour is this blue pen? <laughs> How long's the 40 hour famine? <laughs> that was from a parent. <laughs> it's probably Metallica's mum, to be honest. I, I, my favourite, I was wearing a t-shirt and it was, um, had a, it was had a map of New Zealand. And, and, and to be fair, it was kind of grey on grey, tone on tone. So it was fairly subtle. One of the kids goes, oh, miss, I think you spilled coffee on your shirt. <laughs> I said, is it in the shape of New Zealand? They're like, oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> so when they say there's no such thing as a stupid question, that's not true. But it doesn't matter. Because you're there and you ask the question, yeah? So you can ask some good questions. Third part of this verse is your love, O Lord, supported me. Not your love, O Lord, wrapped me in cotton wool, insulated me from the pain. The inference is I was on a lean and I needed some support. 
Now, I know there's always someone, um, you know, in a church setting who's like, oh, well, you can't talk about anxiety in church because the Bible says be anxious for nothing. I'm like, I know. It also says that by Jesus' stripes we are healed. And there's quite a few people wearing glasses. <laughs> Too soon? Let me talk to the people with glasses, and I wear glasses too, so it's not a judgment on you. Could God heal your eyesight? Has God healed your eyesight up until now? Do we want to think about why? No, I'm kidding. Should you take your glasses off and drive home? Please don't, no. (laughs) Guys, I'll be really honest, we live in the tension between the two. We believe that God can heal, and yet we wear our glasses, because we need the help. And we live in the tension between those two realities. I believe that my mind can be renewed in Christ and we can be anxious for nothing and yet some days I wake up and I deal with depression and anxiety and burnout and I live in the tension between the two realities. My mum was the world's most well-behaved Christian woman. If you could fire any shots at me, you wouldn't have been able to fire them at my mum because she was so well-behaved. She spent the last 15 years of her life with Parkinson's disease. Passed away. And I was speaking at a conference and a young man came up to me and he said, if your mum had had more faith, she wouldn't have had that. He's in the hospital now. (laughs) And I should be in jail. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm kidding. Take that off the tape. (laughs) Woo, hometown advantage. Yeah, baby. But haven't we heard the subtle messages? 